Hi there, it's Lerald. Today I'm going to be talking about Protection Warrior. As I said before with my monk guide, this will probably be the last Protection Warrior overall guide that I do for Legion. But if anything changes between now and the release of Battle for Azeroth, I'll certainly put out updates corresponding to that. So let's dive right into what I consider to be the top pros and cons of playing a Protection Warrior. The class has incredibly powerful defensive cooldowns that, thanks to anger management, are up all of the time. Because of that, and the tier 21 bonuses, the class deals a lot of damage. Protection Warriors are one of the most mobile of the tank classes as well. They're like an angry metal-plated ping pong ball just bouncing around the battlefield. And they have an incredibly active playstyle that's very rewarding to skilled players. And finally, Prot Warrior has very nice tier 21 bonuses, especially the two-piece. Now moving on to the cons, the active mitigation tools for Prot Warrior are really unforgiving. Shield block is strong while it's active, but you are pretty weak when it's not active. And for those handful of dungeon bosses in this expansion where you need to have an actual active mitigation tool up in order to prevent some sort of negative effect, Prot Warriors can be one of the clumsiest classes to handle that sort of mechanic. Also, while Prot Warriors have great self-shielding through Ignore Pain, they don't have any real self-healing unless they're able to kill mobs while in combat and then use Victory Rush. That's great out in the world, and there are certainly spots where you can game it while you're doing Mythic Plus, but in raids, you pretty much have no self-healing tools at all. Going back to that list of pros, with great cooldowns comes great cooldown management. Basically, on a warrior, if you suck at cooldowns, you will probably die. And this is especially accentuated by the fact that warriors have a lower health pool than other tanks, which makes them struggle against burst damage. Sure, they have like six defensive cooldowns to deal with all that burst damage, but when those are down, you might be asking for a res. Probably the biggest frustration I have with Prot Warrior is the fact that their artifact skill, Neltharian's Fury, is terrible. It looks great, it's great for getting screenshots for Prot Warrior guides, <laughs> but in terms of actually using it in-game, it's bad. It prevents you from using any other abilities. If you get stunned or knocked back or whatever while it's active, it gets canceled and it really does crappy damage. It basically just is a, I'm guaranteed to block the next couple of attacks, desperation defensive move, but it's pretty bad. The last con to playing warrior is the same as the last pro to playing warrior. They have extremely good tier 21 bonuses, especially the two piece. This means that until you have the two piece, the class really doesn't feel complete. Being able to get the two-piece even from LFR makes that not that bad of a drawback, but still, it's not great. So let's jump into the talent section real quickly. A really nice thing about Prot Warrior is they basically have one talent set up to totally handle all content. There are really only eight couple of very small talents that you can change around that I'll hit on right here. In the first tier, there is the choice between Shockwave and Warbringer. This is a pretty small Mythic Plus only kind of decision. If you have a melee DPS in your group and you like to focus Intercept onto your melee, then Warbringer will wind up providing quite a lot more stuns than Shockwave, especially considering that Warbringer isn't on any sort of diminishing return at all, not even with itself. If you don't have that sort of a group set up, then you're better off just going with Shockwave. You cast it at the mobs, they're stunned briefly. It's really unremarkable. The only other spot where you really have any sort of decision making to do is in Bounding Stride versus Crackling Thunder. Bounding Stride's obviously better for mobility than Crackling Thunder, although if you have a bunch of adds sort of scattering into an area, the increased pickup radius for Thunderclap will help a little bit. So that's 
pretty much where you would take Crackling Thunder. If you're still using tier 20 set bonuses, then Warlord's Challenge can actually become a pretty solid throughput option over either of the other two. Alright, let's jump into the Protection Warrior rotation. Now, assuming you're running Devastator, which you really should, the normal rotation is very simple, and it's pretty much based all around resetting Shield Slam. So here it is, Shield Slam, Thunderclap, and Revenge. Generally speaking, you really only want to use Revenge if it's free, due to a parry, or if you're trying to dump Rage. Now, you don't have to be capped on Rage or even that close to dump Rage, but if you are, say, below 60 Rage and you're taking quite a bit of damage, it's probably better to spin that Rage on an Ignore Pain or in maintaining Shield Block rather than throwing it out there as damage and maybe dying. As for defensive abilities, you want to try to maintain shield block as much as possible whenever you're actively tanking, and spend all of your excess rage on ignore pain. There is one little nuance that I think is worth mentioning, and that is if you're wearing the tier 21 two-piece and you have Battlecry active, then the rotation basically turns into cast shield slam the entire time. One important thing that you do want to make sure of is that you cast Thunderclap right before casting Battlecry in order to refresh Neltharian's Thunder. And if you can, always try to have Shield Block up during that whole Battlecry and Shield Slam combo because it's basically a 30% damage increase to the whole thing. As for how to gear, the setup is pretty simple. Haste is better than Mastery, which is better than Verse, which is better than Crit. Now let's jump into Legendaries. Thunder God's Vigor is by far the best Protection Warrior Legendary. It greatly reduces the cooldown of Demoralizing Shout. Combined with Booming Voice, that's a massive increase to Rage Generation and Damage Output. Kakushan's Stormscale Gauntlets are definitely the number two offensive option for Warriors, and they're a really good defensive option as well due to the increased Rage Generation that they provide. Manoroth's Bloodletting Manacles are a totally defensive legendary, but they provide quite a lot of self-healing. The Walls Fell, when it was first redesigned, was still a pretty lousy legendary, but the Tier 21 two-piece, along with Anger Management and Booming Voice and that whole talent setup, actually makes it into a pretty solid piece. Archimonde's Hatred Reborn is probably on a tier below this set of legendaries, but it's still pretty decent. It's a good offensive piece that provides a moderate defensive cooldown, and it can be comboed with Last Stand to make it 30% more effective. There are two legendaries I want to touch on, not really for their combat value, but just for their everyday quality of life value as a warrior. And those are Timeless Stratagem and Agrimar's Stride. Between the two of these, they are a pretty massive mobility increase, and while I would never wear these in combat if I had other legendaries, I do like to have a set devoted to equipping both of these at the same time. I use it primarily for running around when I'm inside an area where I'm not in combat, like the Vindicar, or if I'm running between packs in dungeons or running back after a wipe in raids, I like to flick this set on and then, before I get back into combat, switch back to my regular combat set. I keep some pieces of gear in this set, specifically transmog to look extra hideous, just so that if I'm about to enter combat while wearing my mobility set, I'm able to realize, oh, I look like a Ronald McDonald nightmare. And then I can quickly flick back to my normal combat set and then proceed as normal rather than doing like, you know, half as much damage and missing out on tons of defense and all of that. And lastly, I just want to mention Insignia of the Grand Army, the legendary that comes from completing Antorus the Burning Throne. It's not good. If it's all you have, I guess you should wear it, but yeah, ultimately you want to try and get other stuff. Let's move on to Trinkets. First and foremost, Amonthul's vision is amazing. Wear it 100% of the time, if possible. 
Once you get it, you probably won't take it off until Battle for Azeroth. Agrimar's Conviction is not great, but it is fine. Unless you have Amantul's, you should always wear it in Antorus because it's a big raid DPS increase. Outside of Antorus, you should probably only wear it if it's a major item level increase, but unfortunately, it probably is. Apocalypse Drive is a fantastic overall damage reduction trinket. It's particularly strong when tanking AoE packs, such as in Mythic Dungeons. Dima's Glacial Aegis is another strong damage reduction trinket that shines in similar situations to Apocalypse Drive. Smoldering Titan Guard is a very cheesy trinket, and it's not good at all under normal circumstances, but in large scale AoE, it can do hilarious amounts of damage. That's about all it's good for, and the negative effect of the trinket is not appealing, but it is what it is. Unstable Arcano Crystal remains pretty much the best trinket option available to Protection Warriors. A 910 item level Unstable Arcano Crystal from the Relinquished Vendor on the Vendicar will probably last you through to the end of the expansion. It's that good. Darkmoon Deck Immortality is another trinket that's worth way more damage reduction than its item level indicates. It's Probably still the most reliable damage reduction trinket, but it has fallen by the wayside as other trinkets are titan forging up into the stratosphere, and ultimately, it's not nearly as good for protection warrior or protection paladin, classes with shields that have quite a bit more armor than other classes. Strength haste stat sticks are another great trinket option. While they lack the on-use power of Apocalypse Drive or Dima's Glacial Aegis, they still offer a lot of overall offensive and defensive value. Let's talk about that Tier 21 that I've been mentioning over and over. Protection Warrior Tier 21 two-piece is amazing. It's one of the best set bonuses that's ever been put into this game. It's pretty much universally beloved by Prot Warriors, and it's a major part of why the class is so fun to play right now. As I said before during your rotation section, basically when you pop Battle Cry, you just want to shield slam uh, until you can't anymore. You definitely want to have Battle Cry and Demoralizing Shout up at the same time as much as possible due to the artifact trait Might of the Vrykul. That synergy of the Tier 21 2 piece, Battle Cry, and Demoralizing Shout all being there together is going to make you generate massively increased rage compared to just using each of those abilities as they come up. The four piece for Protection Warrior is not nearly as well loved. And while it is quite good from a mathematical damage reduction standpoint, it's extremely passive and therefore pretty boring. It does make Protection Warrior a bit more forgiving through passive damage reduction, so that is nice. It's not worth giving up a ton of item level for unlike the two-piece. One thing that's not apparent from the description of the bonus is that it does actually function whether you have Ignore Pain up or not. If you don't have Ignore Pain active and you block an attack, the set bonus actually gives you a buff that will increase the value of your next Ignore Pain. But ultimately, the four-piece makes maintaining Ignore Pain throughout the course of a fight a lot easier, which is good. In contrast to the decent but kind of boring tier 21 4 piece, tier 20 bonuses are still outstanding and pretty well liked by the warrior community. A lot of warriors are still wearing tier 20 4 piece along with the tier 21 2 piece, which obviously means you can't wear Kakushans. While that's tragic, the synergy between both of the tier 20 bonuses and tier 21's 2 piece is incredibly strong. As is usually the case though, this is really only worth doing with tier 20 that's titan forged up to a very high item level. If you're sacrificing a lot of item level to pull this off, the increased rage generation just won't compensate for your reduced health pool and stats. Let me quickly touch on gems and enchants. For gems, you just want haste all day, haste all day. You can do a defensive enchant to your neck, but the value that you get from them is really small, and Hidden Seder tends to outperform them overall. As for the cloak, there's really only one option, strength. And for rings, it's haste and nothing else. 
I created a Protection Warrior Netherlight Crucible guide video back when it was introduced, so if you'd like a deeper analysis on the NLC, check it out. For the most part, Prop Warrior gets more value out of the Tier 2 Netherlight Crucible traits than it does out of its Tier 3 Weapon traits. The standout Tier 2 traits are Light Speed, Master of Shadows, and all five of the traits that deal direct damage. There are four standout Relic traits for Prop Warrior. Dragon Skin is the best all-around defensive trait, followed very closely by Bastion of the Aspects. And Rage of the Fallen is slightly ahead of Thunder Crash on offensive value. Everything beyond those four traits is pretty close in value, in that they're pretty low in value. Relic item level is pretty important to Prop Warrior, and you really don't want to sacrifice very much to get better traits. If you wind up dropping one or two weapon item levels to greatly improve your traits, that's definitely worth doing, but if we're talking five or ten item levels on the weapon, there's pretty much no traits that are going to justify that significant of a drop. Well, I think that about covers it. Like, subscribe, comment, y you know how YouTube works. Thanks for watching. Bye!